All right, let's see if this works. If you can hear me and see me, uh, let me know in the chat. And once we've got a little bit of confirmation that we're all set, uh, we will get started. There we go. Got a few people here. Good morning, everyone. Um, let's make sure everyone can see too. Can you see my screen? Um, is everyone able to read it? See it pretty well? All right, this is great. Any problems with the audio or are we all set to go? All right, well, good morning folks. Um, this is gonna be a pretty informal presentation here um, and we're gonna cover, we're gonna recover recover some of the stuff that happened with the uh, the Lumineer rocket, which if you're not familiar, is a rocket that I flew back in April. Um, the intention with Lumineer up until the very last minute was to get my level three certification with it. And for a whole bunch of reasons that did not happen. Um, so I wanna walk through uh, two things in a lot of detail. Uh, one of them is the fin construction because it's the thing that I'm most proud of. Actually, let me go get them one second here. Um, Okay, should have brought these here first. These are the fins for Lumineer. They are uh, G10 base and a fiberglass tip to tip layup. Um, I'm really proud of how they came out. And so we'll talk pretty in depth about those. Then we will uh, talk a little bit about the recovery system, look at a couple of plots of data and then talk about the level three process. Um, and so yeah, let's get started. If you guys have questions along the way, I'll keep an eye on the chat and um, I'll try to answer them as we go, unless it's something that requires a more in-depth answer. Um, so um, I was also told that there's a little bit of a delay here too. So bear with me if, if things are a little bit rough. Um, let me rearrange my screen. Um, all right, here we go. So how not to get your level three. Um, this is Lumineer here. This is a few photos of it. It is a 98 millimeter minimum diameter rocket to 30,000 feet. And that is maybe rule number one about how not to get your level three. That is a wildly ambitious project for someone like myself who has flown like two uh, high power rockets. Um, and I bit off a lot more that I could chew with this. It's, it's actually, um, I am very proud of how this thing got built, but it is a miracle that it worked as well as it did even given that it didn't succeed fully. Um, it's a fiberglass airframe, um, a 60 inch section and a 30 inch section from Mad Cow with the 5.5 5, 5 to 1 von Karman nose cone and the uh, custom fins. You can also see we've got a uh, rail guide, a uh, flyaway rail guide on the right. That's a video of it launching there. These are the grains of the motor. So this is a CTI N1560. Uh, so it's a six grain, fits in a 6G XL case. Um, it's a moon burner too. Um, and I put up a plot of the burn profile here. I really like long burning motors. Um, it's just a thing that has carried over from the TVC stuff that I've done. Um, long burning is like the most realistic. You get, you get a crazy good smoke trail. You get a lot of speed. Um, and it actually depends how you optimize too, because as your rocket changes, like long burning is either more or less beneficial. But anyway, it's an 11 second burn time. It's a lot of thrust, it's very regressive. And just moon burners are cool as a concept as it is. Um, here's a plot of the altitude here. We will get more into data later, but I just wanted to show, um, we got up to about 9,700 meters, which is some amount in feet. Some, you can convert it if you want. Uh, I'm not very good at uh, Imperial, but yeah, 9,700 meters. And one thing to note is uh, if you take a look, the descent profile is pretty interesting here. We've got a couple like that. You can tell that the descent rate changes a little bit. Um, we'll look at that later. And then you can also tell, it doesn't really look like we got a main parachute out, which if you're familiar at all with the rocket, <laughs> you are well aware of. Um, this is the deployment system here. So it'll, this is a clip that'll loop a couple of times. Hopefully it's not too glitchy. Um, the deployment for the drogue parachute and getting the nose cone off was done with a pneumatic piston. Um, but instead of using uh, pneumatics or purely air pressure, we use um, what's called a pyrobolt. This technique is 
um, taken from the MIT rocket team. Um, and Charlie Garcia helped me a lot with this build. Um, but the MIT rocket team came up with this idea to use, or, or is rather good at spearheading this idea to use something called a fire bolt or a pyro bolt. Um, and so um, you can see that there are two ignition wires that go into this stainless steel bolt that you bore out. You put a little well of black powder in there. You have two igniter heads for one BP slug. Um, and the, uh, the slug of, per, of, of black powder can be ignited by each, either of the igniter heads. Um, so that's how we got the drogue out. And then here's a video of that happening. There we go. This is just a test without any of the parachutes attached. Um, what we're looking at here is do the shear pins break? Um, shear pins are <laughs> honestly, depending on uh, where you're from, shear pins are more of an art than a science. Um, but we had four shear pins around the top of the vehicle. Um, and so this is a test to make sure that works. These are the fins. Uh, as I mentioned, this is the thing that I'm most proud of on the build. And um, we will talk in depth about them, but you can tell that they are very strong. Um, the second I realized I could stand on the fins, I stood on them a lot. Um, and just to be clear, like in standing on them, I have never heard a creaking sound. I have never heard a cracking sound. Um, so they should still be just as strong as they were. Um, uh, oh, and as I mentioned, right, it's a fiberglass tip to tip layup. We use seven layers, seven whole layers of seven and a half ounce fiberglass cloth and one ounce of two ounce cloth for aesthetics. Um, seven layers ended up being, you know, phenomenally overkill for this type of thing. And we'll talk about why a little later. This is the avionics stack. Um, one of the other unique things about Lumineer is that we aimed to use a reaction wheel in the flight. You'll see this big mass of brass at the bottom. Um, so the reaction wheel, the goal was to control the roll axis. This is something that I do commonly on my rockets with thrust vector control because they're going very slow. They don't have many aero torques. So you just need to spin up or down a little bit of mass to generate those roll torques and control the roll axis. With a high powered rocket, a thing that didn't really cross my mind until far too late in the development process is that you're not just resisting random roll torques, you're resisting uh, ever increasing roll torques during flight with what are effectively massive control surfaces. And you're trying to do that with a heavy mass that has a uh, very limited speed. So this is maybe like the worst optimized system uh, for, for controlling the roll axis, but um, it was part of the design and, you know, you live and learn. So uh, there were dual uh, isolated computers on Lumineer. So one of them is Ava, which is my code base. It's a computer that I developed. And uh, obviously, you know, like I'm proud of the work I do, but I can't trust myself 100% of the time. So we also put a uh, COTS computer on there, commercial off the shelf. And that's gonna, that was a telemetrum. Um, the telemetrums are great, by the way, they're super reliable. Um, but that was a telemetrum, uh, AVA broadcast telemetry on 900 megahertz. Um, this is the result. The telemetrum was on 400. We'll talk about that a little bit later too. Um, and uh, yeah, if your level three looks like this, you're probably not gonna get your cert. Uh, <laughs> so we did get, you know, we got the app section back. We got the motor case back. That's super important because it's a, it's a, Pretty beefy case, but you can tell the main hasn't fully deployed here. And then off in the distance is the drogue parachute. And the drogue parachute looks more like a uh, like a bag from a grocery store than it does a parachute. Um, these are the two airframe sections. Just talking a little bit about the um, airframe of the build. So the fins are actually isolated from the motor tube. Um, and they slide around the case, sort of like, almost like a spin can without a bearing. Um, but the, it is a compression fit into um, it is a compression fit into the aero pack that the motor mount is mounted. And if you look up near the top of that booster section, you'll see a black ring, and that is the aero pack, which is a forward retainer for the motor. So the motor screws into the booster tube, and then sandwiched between the motor lip and the booster tube is the fin section. And you can tell that I align it with the the four axes of the vehicle there too. Um, the cuts usually aren't totally perfect and it's sort of like a thing where you match drill, right? It's, it's sort of like a, like a bespoke fit. Um, so I cut this tube off and it fits best in one specific orientation. Um, and then as I mentioned, there's the nose cones, got a little aluminum tip 
Um, really pleased with the paint job there too. Uh, one more time, this is the avionic stack. You can just see a little bit more detail. Um, this is it modeled up in CAD. So we've got the reaction wheel, we have AVA on a sled. We have a very large battery. That's that blue mass right there. Um, that battery is a four cell LiPo um, and was spec'd out to run the reaction wheel at worst case scenario, max speed for about a minute and a half. Um, and that was a very conservative estimate because our time to apogee was 45 seconds and max speed would assume that the control system had gone entirely off the rails. Um, now the, the whole kicker to this is that the reaction wheel ended up flying passive. Um, we had some electrical problems before the flight. And so we realized like it's way safer if we just fly without this thing on. Um, so the other two things that you can see here, if you take a close look, are two cameras. Um, one of the cameras is below the telemetry model on the right. Um, it is a horizon looking camera. This camera did not return any footage because it hit the ground hard enough that the SD card cracked and it was unrecoverable. I sent it to a data recovery center too and they, they were like, we can't do anything about this. And then the same, uh, the same with a camera that actually looked up at the parachutes too. Um, it's very hard to see on the right there, but. Um, we had one that poked up and out uh, towards that piston section. And so uh, both of those cameras did record. I like, presumably they got great footage and I will never know because uh, the SD cards got cracked. Um, this is the radio mount on the bottom right. You can sort of see where it's located on the vehicle. Um, there are three radios right here. The first one is passive. It's the red radio, uh, the very top right. That is the GPS antenna. Um, so we're tracking GPS on both flight computers. Then we have our 900 Hertz uh, telemetry module for AVA. That's actually, uh, it's a radio called an XB. It's very easy to use. And then on the left um, is a special payload. This one is developed by uh, USC RPL. Um, so USC is the only college team to ever get to space. And they actually did it twice, depending on how you count it. If you count uh, ballistic impact as, as a successful attempt. Um, but they do these really impressive rockets and they need to verify how high they go. So this is a range finder that operates at 430 megahertz. Um, it's an experimental like in-house developed range finder and it uses triangulation between different ground stations to get your altitude. Um, so you don't use parametric altitude, you don't need to use GPS altitude because that'll get locked out as you get to space. And so they have this bespoke solution and this, this was a test flight. Um, for one of their computers. Um, so we put it on, I think, our like 12 volt bus or something like that. Um, and then finally, moving all the way down, this is uh, the camera section for Lumineer. This is the outboard cameras. We have one that looks up the vehicle and one that looks down. Um, the housing was 3D printed and then um, uh, epoxied over so that we didn't have any layer lines. Now, so max speed for this is Mach 1.7. That's not going to rip apart your 3D printed parts, but it's as you get faster and faster, you start to worry about that kind of thing. If you like between uh, worry about separation between the layers. Um, so I epoxied over the uh, mount to give it more of like a plastic outside uh, or like a hard shell around it. Um, you'll also see that there's a ground station on the right with some imagery from one of the cameras. So we actually used um, FPV radios, if you've seen those racing drones where people have the goggles on, it's the same type of technology here where we've got one of those radios that's powered by AVA um, in the background, beaming video down to the ground. Now, this didn't work for a bunch of reasons too. Again, a lot of lessons learned here. Um, we put a lot of radios in one space on the vehicle and uh, Lumineer was not super happy about that. So we had some trouble connecting with this camera on the on the ground, um, and the, uh, <laughs> the 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 irony of it all is that we still tried to maintain connection during flight, but nobody was looking at the screen. Um, and so while other telemetry sources started to black out as the vehicle ascended into the sky, um, <laughs> it's possible that this. Uh, feed of video was still active and nobody knew and no one will ever know because it didn't get recorded. Um, but anyway, all of these things aside, let's talk a little bit about the fins here. So uh, this is the fins painted. The logo that's on here is um, the logo of an artist that I worked with um, who I tossed over some CAD files to and I said, hey, I, you know, I'm not amazing at design. Um, do you want to take a crack at uh, 
spinning up a color scheme scheme. I told him that I wanted a blue and white color scheme and he designed like this beautiful looking um, paint job for the vehicle. So we put his logo on there. Um, yeah, Charles says lessons to be learned. Don't overcomplicate your L3. Yeah, that's a that's probably rule number one. Um, I learned that lesson. I probably should have been able to learn it without flying a rocket, but this was also an effective way to learn it. So the fin can I mentioned was separate from the booster section, and this is because this is actually my first composite layup, um, or it's my first fin layup at least. I did four or five practice parts. Um, you know, in the, in the week or two leading up to this. Um, but this is my first composite layup. And so I didn't trust myself to do a great job. So not only did I build one fin can, I actually built two um, for the same vehicle. I had this nightmare scenario where like weeks before launch, I was still working on the fin can. And uh, the, the scenario was like, what if I mess something up? What if I mount a fin super crooked? You can actually tell the difference too. The, the, the can on the right is the flight unit, curing some of the fillets there. The can on the left is a lot more rough. You know, we didn't tape down around the fillets very well. You can see some nicks in the in the G10 base of the fins there. Um, and so, yeah, I, I actually, I, I built two fin cans. Um, and the one on the right is is this guy. So that's the, that's the flight unit. Um, so as I mentioned, it's cut out of G10 base. This is a quarter inch base. I cut the fin shape out there and then used a circular saw to get a like rough shape out of the fin. Um, I feel like a bandsaw would have been better for this, but I don't have a bandsaw. So you use what you got. Um, after that, I sanded them down. Um, it's important that the fins match each other a little bit more than it's like more important that the fins match each other rather than match the CAD or the simulation because we actually designed the fins with a lot of margin. Um, the fin shape and fin size gave us a stability caliber of 4.0. So we were overstable on this vehicle. And uh, you'll see why that you know, had, some, had some benefits and drawbacks there. Um, but we were overstable on this vehicle. And so I was happy to remove a little bit of material from each of the fins. So I clamped them all together, sanded them down uh, to get them you know, roughly the same shape. Um, also have a few questions here. Um, Bob says, for any cert flight, L1, L2, L3, the only thing that should be different than your previous rockets is the size of the motor, one thing at a time. Yep. What blade did you cut with? Uh, I had a little carbide tip blade that I use for a lot of the, like, cutting aluminum stock. Um, it's not, it may not be the right tool for the job, but it cut through well enough. Um, yeah, the, it depends on if your objective is to just get the L3 cert or to learn as much as possible, as fast as possible. That is, uh, that is absolutely true. I, I learned a whole lot in extremely an extremely short amount of time. So um, if that's the goal of the L3, then I accomplished that at least. This is uh, chamfering the fin here. Um, I just sort of eyeballed it. Um, this felt like a thing that at this scale, I could dial in by looking at it and comparing with other fins. Um, so that's, that's the chamfering. I, I chamfered the leading and trailing edges. Um, and these are the four final fins, um, or fin bases, at least. This is the fin jig. Um, and I'm, I'm proud of how this came out, too. So um, the goal was to be able to 3D print it. Um, trusting the rigidity of your 3D printer to create a good fin jig is uh, a little bit sketchy, but it can work. And it was fine enough for this. Um, so it prints in eight parts and it took, I believe about four total days to print. Um, you can sort of see where the sections D like, like separate and I'll show another photo in a second here. Um, but they all screw together at the edge and then they attach the top to bottom with, it's either half inch or three eighths threaded rod. Um, and so you can see this is the version that gets put together right here. So we've got. I'm pretty sure it's half inch rod. Um, but anyway, I, I actually, I didn't buy enough of the threaded rod at Lowe's. And so I ended up with only half of the stiffness in the mount that I uh, was supposed to. And yet still we got really good alignment. It was like within 0.2 degrees or something. Um, here is us setting up the fins. Uh, so this is just the root bond first. If you, if you guys have built an L3 before you, know exactly what this is but we do the root bond first where we epoxy the face of the bottom of the fin to the um like like normal to the uh radius of the can 
Um, so this set up for about a full day. I let it cure really slow and just like didn't touch it after I let it set. Um, then I took the fins out. So this is again, just the root bond, no fillets, no anything. This is a great time to check your straightness of your fins because after this, you aren't gonna have a flat surface on them or you're gonna have committed a lot of epoxy to the fin can. So what I did is I measured the flatness of my garage floor, tried to compensate for that. I measured the flatness of my table and then the like natural deflection between the fins and across the garage, the garage door. So that's what you're seeing here is two shots split. Um, so there's a laser level that goes in the fin. You measure the height of that. The laser hits the garage door. You measure the height of that. You factor in the uh, up or down of your garage floor slope. Um, and, you know, if you assume it's constant and it gets more simple, but obviously like some garage floors, if you're not doing a pour of cement all at once, it's not going to be uh, stable, but you can get pretty good ideas from the deltas there of what your deflection angles are. And from these numbers, I'm sort of pulling from memory. I think we got on most fins a deflection of around 0 0.2 degrees. Um, it might've been 0 0.1, um, but what we're talking about is basically the roll deflection of each fin. And in open rocket, that roll deflection correlated to about 900 Hertz roll rate. This was really important to characterize for the reaction wheel because your control system, you know, you need to know your absolute maximums to design a control system around it. Um, and in theory, this should have worked for the reaction wheel. But again, we flew with the wheel off. Um, all right, let me uh, back up just a little bit. Uh, Lauren says, can you repeat again what you mean by it was overstable? Yeah, sure, I, I breezed past that a little bit. Um, what I mean by that is the fins are actually too big for the vehicle. Um, you shoot for a stability caliber as a very rough rule of thumb between one and two, if you're simulating an open rocket or rock sim, or um, I don't know if RAS Arrow gives you a stability caliber, but um, you shoot for that stability caliber and, and something that's more stable than that will be more susceptible to weather cocking, tilting into the wind. Um, and then it also has the chance to uh, go stable in scenarios where you don't want it to be stable, which stay tuned. Um, yep. Uh, what kind of epoxy did you use? Oh, good. I forgot to cover this. Um, this actually is great for the next slide. All of the filleting and bonding epoxy <clears throat> that is gray here is Loctite Hysol. Um, I quite liked the Loctite Hysol. I thought it was really good and um, easy to work with for fillets. It's very thick, um, very viscous. And then um, it, it, when given the right scenario, it cures very fast. <coughs> um, I... 6,000% don't recommend that you do this. It's very sketchy. Um, I was trying to operate on a really accelerated timeline. And so what I did is I rested a hairdryer on high um, on little blocks of uh, like stock material for CNC stuff. So um, this is extruded stock aluminum, stainless steel and titanium um, that's holding up the hairdryer um, just so that we don't burn the cardboard. And then it goes into a cardboard box and I stuck my meat thermometer in the corner to monitor the temperature so that I could estimate cure times because heat accelerates, uh, heat accelerates cure times. To give you an idea of how well it does this, a cure time for, you know, at room temperature for Loctite Hysol is something like 24 hours, but then it's going to really slowly cure over the next 72, even more hours. Now, if you're a normal rocketeer doing things on a normal schedule, that's fine. That's not an issue. And if you're me trying to operate on a very tight schedule, um, that is too much time. So um, this shortened that cure time of 24 to 72 hours down to about one and a half to two hours, um, which means that you could do multiple fillets in one day um, and cure very fast. One thing I didn't mention here is that we spec'd out for a fillet radius of about an inch and a half, um, which is thick. That's a lot. Um, we did this because, as I mentioned, this is my first composite layup. So I didn't trust myself to do a very good job with you know, any part of this. I, I trusted that I would probably mess a few things up. Um, and so 
I figured let's overbuild everything. So an inch and a half radius was, was more than we needed, um, but we did it anyway. All right. Now it's time to talk about the fiberglass layup stuff. So this is me putting one of the layers on. You can see that I label the, the number of the layer in the order that it goes on. Um, it is very helpful for laying it up, but it does make things like a lot less pretty. Um, it's just, there's like numbers and letters all over this. I think somewhere here, there's a smiley face. Um, yeah, you can just barely, like barely see it. There's supposed to be a smiley face there. Um, anyway. Um, so, oh, and then Sam says, how did you get consistent smooth fillets? Um, patience and uh, the filleting tool. The filleting tool I just drew up in CAD was it, like very, very helpful. That and then patience was really the thing. The other thing is uh, working out bubbles is pretty tricky. Um, you can't really see any in this shot, but you just like, there's sort of a technique to like smoothly coaxing the epoxy into the, to the fillet gaps um, so that you don't trap air bubbles because popping the bubbles is fine, but it does create some like bumps in your, in your um, fillet. So what you want to do is be just more careful in how you apply the epoxy um, at the start rather than try to pop the bubbles at the end. Um, okay. Also, Dave says, I used a pizza box to align the fins on my L3. Nice. Uh, all right, so let's talk about the fiberglass layup. Um, I mentioned before I used seven and a half ounce glass. Um, we used it in a zero to 45 degree pattern. Um, you could also say like 45 to 90 degree pattern, it doesn't matter, but it's basically like one of these. Um, so each layer alternates with the pattern that it uses and we cut it out of the fiberglass as such. Um, I also labeled the degrees. I like labeled the angle of the fiberglass cut and I labeled the um, number of the cut too. I think this is super important because it helps you in the heat of the moment. Once that epoxy is curing, you can't really trust your brain that much. Um, it helps you differentiate between the layers and something you can't really see here is that uh, each layer is actually laid out on the table in the order that I will pick it up. Um, so on the top layer is layer one, and then all the way down at the bottom is the peel ply that goes on last. So it's sort of a thing where you want to set yourself up to not have to think very hard when you're doing your layup. Um, Robert says, what weight cloth and epoxy did you use? So this is, uh, what you're seeing here is seven ounce cloth. This is the two ounce cloth right here that is for the finishing side. The seven ounce or seven and a half ounce cloth is going to hold most of the strength. And then the two ounce cloth, um, is for aesthetics and because if you can sort of imagine like if you're doing a lot of sanding to try to get a really smooth surface finish you don't want to be sanding into your main structural layers because like as soon as you start sanding into that fiberglass cloth you're going to compromise the strength of the, of the, um, the layup so you want to sand into that two ounce layer that's like just there for aesthetics um, and then the epoxy was um what is it called fiberglass uh, system 2000 epoxy and I use the 2060 hardener which hardens it in 60 minutes um, and uh, yeah it was a 60 minute cure time and only after that did I realize that doesn't mean you should work with it for 60 minutes you should work with it for about half of the cure time so if I were going to do it again I would use the 120 minute cure time because it took me about 60 minutes to work with it um, but anyway, yeah, those are the those are the epoxies that I used. Um, so before we go ahead and oh, actually, let me let me take a few more questions here. Careful heating epoxy; it can give off toxic fumes. Yeah, all this stuff, um, the environment that I'm in, some of the shots are easier to tell than others. All of it is done in my garage, and a lot of the time, the garage door is open. Um, you'll also notice in any shot with my face in it, um, I'm wearing a respirator too. Um, and not just for like the particles that end up getting in the air, like sanding fiberglass is <laughs> not good for your lungs, but uh, not just for that. It's, there are some like organics. So it's, it's a respirator with organic cartridges in it too. Um, how do you get consistent smooth fillets? Oh, I already talked about that. Um, are you thinking about selling the fillet tool? Uh, no, not really, but I would have, I'd be happy to give you the, the design file if you want. If you uh, email me, joe at bps.space, I can just give you the, the STL so you can print one yourself. Um, sanding tips for fiberglass. Oh, we're getting there. We're about to get there. Um, so 
Surface preparation is the most important part, in my opinion, of doing a good layup because that sets up the strength of your first bond. And if the bond between your layup and the vehicle itself is not good, then it does not matter how much carbon fiber or fiberglass you use. It does not matter how good you are at doing a layup. It doesn't matter how good your layers adhere between each other. Um, that first bond, that first bond to the surface of the vehicle sets you up for either success or failure. So um, service preparation is very important. And in talking about that, a commonly held belief in surface prep is that you want to grab some rough sandpaper so that you can get really deep grooves for your epoxy to latch onto. And it's sort of like this concept of a mechanical bond, right? Um, and I would like to present you with something called the coastline paradox. So if we wanted to measure the length around the coast of this landmass, and we varied the resolution of the measurement, um, on the left, if we start here and we have, you know, pretty low resolution measurement, um, you know, it's trying to track the surface, but it's not doing a great job. The length of the surface is going to be 2,400 kilometers, you know, roughly speaking. And then as we go up in the resolution, as you get more and more resolution, the length goes to 2,800 kilometers and then 3,400. And you can sort of see the, the whole paradox when you say coastline paradox is that you can get to infinite length this way um, functionally, like as, in terms of like a theoretical math problem. Um, so as you up the resolution, you actually get more and more coast area because at some point you're starting to like trace around the different grains of sand on the beach and it's gonna drastically increase your area. So the reason I bring this up is that in sanding, um, the commonly held belief is to use a rough grit sandpaper, but you will actually get more surface area bonded if you use a finer grit. So that doesn't, you know, that, that holds true to a certain point. Um, but I used, uh, I'm using 80 grit in this shot because I'm just trying to get the shape right. But for the actual surface preparation, I think I used between three and 500 grit sandpaper. Um, something that's a lot more rough than like 120 that you might see in on, on other layups. And so the idea is that you want to increase the surface area that the epoxy can bond to, and that's going to be done most effectively with a finer grit sandpaper rather than a rough grit sandpaper. And then that won't matter unless your surface energy is high. Now, I'm not very good at describing this, but essentially what you want is to open up free hydrogen groups on the surface and the epoxy will be able to bond to this a lot better. So when that happens, we call that having high surface energy, and we can measure that using something called a water break test. Um, so obviously, it's also important, like lots of acetone, lots of isopropyl alcohol, and lots of sanding. And you'll notice that in anything that involves epoxy, I'm always wearing gloves, um, right? So the oils on your skin, they're great for you as a human, and they're terrible for epoxy. Um, and also, epoxy is terrible for you. So it's just, it's bad both ways. Um, so once you prep the surface about as well as you think you can, you'll see that the fillets have been sanded down in this. We've tried really hard to rough up every single part of the side of this G10 base. Here's what you're going to do. Um, so you pour a little bit of water. This is just tap water. I think you probably want to use like distilled water, but it's fine. Um, you pour a little bit of water in a bead on the surface of the fin, and then you take a look at it from the side. So when the water beads up like this, this is what's called having low surface energy or a high, yeah, a high break angle. Um, and so what you're looking at is sort of the water's willingness to spread out, the water's willingness to break its own surface tension, tension and spread out because when it spreads out, that means the energy, or when it spreads out, that means it's like very attractive for the water to try and bond with these free groups that are open on the surface. And we can sort of just look at that. If I draw an angle, um, you can sort of see what I'm talking about. Like the side of this bubble is very steep right now. And in comparison, if we have a higher surface energy, so I went back, I reprepped, um, and then I shot another clip. This is uh, a water droplet that has a higher surface energy. And it's also at a little bit of an angle. So I'm kind of cheating here. Um, but if you look, especially on the left, the surface energy is a lot higher. The water is spreading out. It, like really wants to spread out because there are there's like a lot of 
I don't, I don't quite know how to describe it, but um, it's, it's much easier for the water to break its own surface tension and spread out. And so we have what's called a low break angle. And this is a legit test. It's not like, I know it seems kind of hacky, but this is a legit test. Like Boeing, when they do composites, have acceptable break angles. Um, I think SpaceX, when they do composites, has like, you know, there are acceptable break angles for different parts because that tells you, you know, what the strength of your bond to the surface is. So this is a, this is a legit test. And if you want to know if you've done enough surface prep, um, A, the answer is you probably haven't because this, it takes a long time and a lot of sanding and a lot of IPA and a lot of acetone to get to the point where the break angle starts to get reduced. Um, but you can measure it with something called a water break test. Um, okay. Oops, skipped a few slides here. So this is, um, oh, and one more thing is, is uh, surface preparation should happen as close to your composite layup as possible in terms of time. Um, so as soon as you sand and expose these free groups and like try to get higher surface energy, that, that energy is gonna reduce over time as a function of dust getting on the, um, dust getting on the surface of the material. Um, I don't think there's any oxidization that happens with at least fiberglass, but if you're doing this with metal, that'll happen for sure. Um, the metal will oxidize a little bit. Um, and so you want to try to do a layup like right after you do this water break test and right after you do your surface prep. Um, so what I did here is infuse the, um, the laminating epoxy into the fiberglass weave um, before I put it on the vehicle. And I did it this way because um, the vehicle has a, a, a more complex geometry than I felt comfortable like smoothing out with a little squeegee thing. You can do it either way, but this way also lets you uh, more tightly control how much epoxy you're putting into your composite layup. And the other thing to note about composites is that you don't want too much epoxy. Um, too much epoxy will make your composite fail just like too little epoxy will. Um, so, you know, epoxy is really good in compression and uh, fiberglass or carbon fiber is really good in tension. And uh, you sort of want those two to equally work together. If you have too much epoxy, the epoxy will be the thing that ends up taking that tension load first. And the epoxy is terrible in tension. So it will break and your fiberglass will like, not your fiberglass, your, your layup will fail because of it. Um, so I used a by weight ratio of one to one between epoxy and cloth weight. So you measure the weight of all of your cloth and then you pour the total amount of epoxy and hardener that will match roughly one to one uh, weight. And so that's how I sort of spec'd it out. I squeegeed out a little bit too much epoxy from each of the layers um, and you'll see the effects of that in just a second here. So this is applying the layer to the vehicle. Um, another thing that is helpful here that I didn't do is having fiducials or little um, location markers on the base of your layup. I'm kind of just like, <laughs> I'm just guessing like where the right place for the layer to go is. And that's fine for something like this, for something that's more important. You'd wanna be a little bit more careful about it. Um, but if you know what I mean, like sliding it up or down will make a difference in the strength of the layup a bit. Um, sliding it, you know, from the side to side, you don't want to have it super uneven. Um, so I was fine eyeballing it for this, but you know, it, hindsight 2020, um, putting some more layers on here and you can start to see where some of the problems form. One of the things I did not do with this layup is vacuum bag it. Um, I mentioned that this is my first composite layup and I felt that vacuum bagging would be too much to bite off in one go um, in terms of new techniques and learning how to do something for the first time. I felt like vacuum bagging had a higher risk of me messing something up than it did of creating a good layup. Now the side effect of that is that I came out with a lot of bubbles in my layup. Um, a lot of them happen at the edge of the fiberglass. Um, you can see them pretty easily here you know, there's a lot of good epoxy bond area, but there are plenty of bubbles right around where each layer ends. And that would have been fixed or at least super remedied by a uh, vacuum bag, but you live and learn, right? Um, so this is putting uh, some of the final layers on and then finally the peel ply. Um, so this is right after the, the two ounce layer, we put peel ply on at the very end um, I was told it doesn't soak up any epoxy. I don't totally believe that. I think it soaks up just a little bit of epoxy. Um, 
But mostly what the peel ply is doing is creating a smoother surface finish for you. Um, so I put peel ply on the top of the layup and then I let it cure. <laughs> and by let it cure, I mean, I put it back in my oven. Um, you'll also notice the fire extinguisher there. It's very intentional. Um, this helped once again, reduce cure times uh, from something, you know, on the order of 24 hours to two hours. So imagine being able to do two different sides of a composite layup in one day. Pretty good in terms of time. Um, all right, one second here. John says, do you plan to rebuild Lumineer and then plan for something bigger? Um, I won't be rebuilding Lumineer, but I do eventually want to do a space shot. For reasons that you can see in this presentation and that you can see on my YouTube channel, I'm not ready to do a space shot. I don't have the technology or processes, processes down to do something like that. Right now, we're kind of like notationally looking at 2023 um, to do one of those. Um, but every HPR project that I do is trying to like work up toward the space shot. Um, so in between then and now, I do have my parts to do a second L3. I don't know if I'm gonna go for the L3. We'll talk about that in a little, in a little bit. Um, but I actually, I probably have to start moving a little bit faster here because my session is ending uh, pretty soon. So uh, moving right along here, we've got our um, fiberglass fins. This is what it looks like when they come out of the, my little easy bake here oven. Um, oh, and then Sam says, in hindsight, how many layers of glass would you recommend for this fin can? I feel like you could go get away with three on this. Three, three structural layers and then one aesthetic layer. So three of seven and a half ounce glass and then one of two ounce. Um, that's not backed up by any math. It's sort of a feel thing. Um, yeah, but I did, I did seven. Uh, I sanded off. I opted to, uh, lay the fiberglass over the edge and then sand the rest of it off. Um, and, uh, that's just a shot of that happening. And then here's the final shot of the fins again, where you can see lots of bubbles, um, lots of bubbles in the fins there, but they did end up being strong enough. Um, so I'm going to pick up the pace here. We'll talk a little bit about shoots. This is my drogue parachute in the top and then my main parachute in the bottom. The drogue parachute is a 24 inch nylon um, parachute and the main was either 72 or 84 inch. I can't remember which one it was, um, but both shoots were from Fruity Shoots, which is a great place to get your shoots. Um, and that's that. This is a notational lines diagram. Um, don't read too much into this. It's not actually set up properly. Like it, I'm sort of like mid staging event here. Um, so the drogue basically acts as a pilot for the main parachute. Um, the drogue comes off when the piston fires. Um, then the drogue is consistently pulling on the, uh, line between the deployment bag and the main parachute. And then there are two tender descenders that actually, uh, fire to release that line. One thing I had heard is that tender descenders are not super reliable. Um, I did not have a problem with them, but I could see how they wouldn't be reliable. If you have a really long descent, um, you're whipping around cables um, that have a limited life cycle, a limited um, like bending cycle, if you will. Um, so the tender descenders, each computer can fire each tender descender. And each tender descender has two igniters in it that are um how does this work so like when you fire a tender descender on one computer it fires both tender descenders so one computer can die um, and will be fine and then each tender descender can release the main they're parallel so you don't need to fire both you just need to fire one so there are actually two uh fault protection mechanisms here which is that one computer can die and one tender descender can fail and it can still work um and it did, both of them fired on the way down. Now it didn't release exactly as I wanted, but um, I thought we could take a little bit of a look as we speed up here at the, uh, the failure process. So this is right at Apogee when we've got our drogue parachute inflated and we've got already some tangling in the lines. So we know that things are not great. Um, this is a, a little below 10 kilometers here. As the chute falls back behind the vehicle, um, you can tell that it's still inflated in this shot. Um, and then I want to play a video for you here. It'll loop a couple of times, but at the beginning of the video, the chute is inflated, the rocket whips around, and then when you look back, the chute is no longer inflated, and that's because the chute has torn. 
Um, we blew out the iris of the chute because of the shock loading from the vehicle. Um, so here's, here's a video that plays back and forth. We start out with an inflated chute. The rocket whips around like this. This is very slowed down. And then as it comes back, there it is. That's the chute. There's no more inflation in that chute. It's, it's ripped at this point. Um, so it's not holding any pressure. We're not able to create the drag that we expect. And so that is the ultimate failure point of Lumineer is the drogue chute was not specced to the opening loads that we saw um, at 10 kilometers. We were moving pretty fast to the side and that's, that's ultimately what killed the vehicle. Um, and then just before we wrap up here, I wanted to show uh, this plot. So this is the velocity on the way down from Lumineer. You'll notice a few things. One of the things that is cool is that as you get closer to the lower parts of the atmosphere, the velocity is, does slow down because the atmosphere gets thicker. But you'll notice that there are these three high velocity periods. And when I talked about the vehicle being overstable before, um, what I'm talking about is the vehicle pointing directly downward on descent, even with a drogue at the aft, even with a bunch of lines falling behind it, even with a tangled main parachute falling down, um, we end up in these stable nose down periods of descent. Um, even with no nose cone on the front, we had enough stability from those fins that uh, the vehicle picked up a bunch of speed. And then as you, go, as you start to go fast enough, your center of pressure shifts forward a little bit and that prompts the vehicle to flip back to a flat spin. So we oscillate between flat spin and stable nose down on the way down. And unfortunately, we were in a stable nose down period when we came close to the ground, which resulted in this. Um, and then I just before we wrap up here, I had a couple of more interesting plots. This is the acceleration plot from the rocket motor. Um, so this is just from the Ava flight computer. We've got our acceleration here in meters per second squared. Um, you can see the you can see the burn profile isn't quite as smooth uh, as we see in um, the thrust curve data. And that is because when we put the motor together, we didn't have a mandrel to keep the cores exactly straight. So we had a few step overs in the um, core of the rocket motor, um, which prevent slash like modify some of the mass flux as it as like it, you're, you're, you're changing the bur burn profile of the motor depending on how you assemble it. And so that's sort of what we're seeing here when you see the step over at about four seconds. Um, that's one of the effects there. And this is really cool. This is my favorite plot from the whole entire flight. The red line is non-axial acceleration, which means acceleration to the side. So um, if the rocket is you know, burning really hard and going really fast, we're not gonna see it on this axis. If it whips around, we are gonna see it. And then the yellow line is our Mach number. So we get up to, uh, I think it's at back, actually it's actually about like one, Mach 1.6. But right when we pass Mach 1, right at about four and a half seconds, we see the effects of passing Mach 1. We see the effects of going supersonic. Um, so there's a big whip. Um, the, the dynamics change when your flow goes from incompressible to compressible. And um, so that's, that's one thing. And then uh, right around 11 seconds is when the motor burns out. So um, most of these vehicles, if they're big enough, have some amount of flex in the airframe. They have some amount of flex in all of the like fixturing for the different parts that are on the rocket. That's what we're seeing here is that flex releasing because the rocket is no longer under load um, and the load is coming from the literal opposite direction. And then finally, towards the end of the plot here, right around 19 seconds, we can see as we dip below Mach 1 and dip back into that transonic regime, the vehicle whips around again. So we get really interesting dynamics. Um, uh, yeah, we just get really interesting dynamics as we pass Mach 1. And that, man, it went a little longer than I thought, but that is Lumineer. Um, and you'll notice, I just want to mention really quick, you'll notice that we're flying from, it's not from the Friends of Amateur Rocketry test site that we planned to. We don't have to get into it unless someone asks a question about it. Um, but the process of trying to get my level three with this vehicle was... Um, difficult because of, partially because of how I chose to build the vehicle, right? So it's a very ambitious build for a level three. It's way overcomplicated for a level three. And that's part of the problem. And then the other part was that we ran into a lot of issues um, with the launch site, 
with regulations, with just general mistakes. And um, so we ended up flying under USC's waiver for their vehicle that they were flying at the Reaction Research Society. Um, and it may seem, how do I put this? Um, it may seem a little headstrong to still fly the vehicle if we couldn't get the cert. Um, but what happened is that we showed up on launch day uh, and one of the uh, advisors for the project, one of the TAPs for the project, did not know until launch day that we could not fly this motor and legally certify it in California under TRA or NAR. Um, we could legally fly the motor at the test sites because FAR and RRS are experimental ranges and they're, they're legal motors to fly, but we could not legally cert with them. Um, but we found that out on launch day after integrating $1,500 worth of propellant. So I was not going to leave California without flying. Um, so that is why we ended up flying the vehicle. And uh, yeah, that's the presentation. And I, will, I would be happy to take some questions. You can put them in uh, the Q&A tab. You can put them in the chat. I will try to get them both. Maybe let's focus on the Q&A tab. And it looks like uh, I probably missed a few here. Um, Realize that the skeleton of Lumineer is glass. Not sure what happens with your L3. Starts with fiber tubes and plywood fins in terms of cleaning and solvents. Uh, Jonathan, I'm not sure exactly what you're asking here. If you want to ask another question um, to clear it up, that would be great. Um, oh, yeah. John uh, asked if I'm selling the filleting tool. Um, I'm not selling it, but if you just email joe at bps.space, I'm happy to just send you the STL file. Um, it's also very easy to mock up in CAD if you have any type of um, computer-aided design program. Um, it's really easy to mock that up. Um, let's see. What factors weighed in the decision to go minimum diameter? Um, the design evolved because Charlie Garcia did what he is very good at doing, which is um, pushing me forward in rocketry. So he gave me a few parts. He gave me a clamp-on fin cam and a 30-inch section um, of tubing. Um, and said, now you have the parts and you can't not build it. Um, so that is how the design evolved uh, for a four inch minimum diameter vehicle. Um, did you ever think about just using streamers? Just a thought. Um, so no to streamers. I think they don't scale very well to this size of vehicle, but I do have a, a new favorite way to do uh, HPR rocket design, which is, um, lean into the expendable rocket idea. Um, don't send it careening into the ground, but for the space shot, when we do something that's crazy high altitude, a lot of these vehicles aren't gonna fly more than once because they're bespoke solutions. So just toss a drogue on there, make sure it comes down safely, make sure it won't hurt anyone if it comes down and be done with it. Um, main parachutes take up a lot of mass, especially as you get really big. Um, they also take up a lot of space and uh, add some complexity. And it's a lot easier to just say, nope, we have a drogue and we're going to hit the ground a little hard, so we'll overbuild our fin cam. Um, and overbuilding is something that I'm getting pretty good at. So um, that's, my, that's my new favorite thing is um, you can simplify by just having a single stage recovery system, or you can do made at Apogee and sign yourself up for a very long walk. Um, I'm worried that alcohol and other solvents will not be nice to cardboard body tubes and plywood fins when prepping and laying up. Oh, I get it, Jonathan. Yeah. Um, so for surface prep on cardboard, I don't know how exactly you do that, but I agree that um, solvents that soak into the material are going to weaken it. Um, for that, you might do just one pass of sanding and then, or a couple passes of sanding and then one pass of acetone and call it a day. Um, yeah, Ed says, can you say anything about your Mark Rober collab? <laughs> no, I cannot. Uh, I cannot talk about that. Uh, but it is a thing and, uh, presumably it will be done at some point. That, that's what I can say. Uh, Zeke says, I'm getting my level one at the same place where you got your level one thrust to make thrust space. Oh, um, at, uh, uh, CMAS is the organization, but it is that site in Maine, right, Zeke? Um, man, I missed that place. That was really cool. Um, it's a beautiful field. Um, what are your next plans for HPR before the space shot? Okay, 
So we need a lot of, of stuff to bridge the gap, right? Um, so uh, the space shot is, is planned to be a two stage. We're going to work with a different company to pour the propellant, but we'll manufacture the case and the grain, uh, the case in the nozzle, the closures. Um, and uh, so uh, I do have the parts to do a second attempt at a level three, something that's more simple. Um, I don't have anything on the books right now to actually fly it, um, but getting a level three would be a good idea. I'm not sure that I want to do it. It's not actually required on the on the path to getting a space shot, but more flight experience is needed regardless of what happens. So it may just be a good idea. Um, there's also a rocket that I want to fly uh, this year that ends up going to about Mach three and a half. Um, it's a low altitude, high speed demonstrator. Um, and so that is, uh, that's part of build process um, or that's part of the like scale up process. And then as we start to do qualification and testing programs for the propellant for the space shot, um, that will all fly on um, basically like flight representative vehicles for the first and second stage of the space shot. We'll fly those either one or both of them isolated um, so that they can get flight tested before we put them together and fly them all at once. Um, uh let's see john says what was the motor code brand for that l3 so it was a cti it's the cesaroni n 1560 um it's a moon burner burns for 11 seconds and um it uses a super fancy motor case uh <laughs> uh let's see that's a t-shirt over design is something i'm good at yes it is uh what are your plans oh yeah i already answered that um Lauren says, what would have helped with the overstability of the rocket? Uh, Lauren, I would have reduced the size of the fins. Oh, I was trying to um, address this before. So the fin shape is the exact same as the three fin clamp-on fins that Charlie gave me. And you can't certify with clamp-on fins. I actually think it's kind of a crazy rule because you can certify in a bunch of other ways that are simpler. But um, you can't certify with clamp-on fins. So... I moved from three fins to four fins, but didn't change the shape and didn't change the size. So we went from having enough stability to having more than enough stability. Um, and just reducing the fin size would have, would have changed that or um, getting rid of the reaction wheels. So reducing some of the, the mass that's on, on the up front of the vehicle would have helped shift the stability um, into a more like manageable range. Um, okay. Um, let's see, that's that. How could the antennas uh, for Ava and the telemetrum to the ground have been placed better? Yeah, so Bennett uh, is aware that we had a lot of trouble um, connecting with the vehicle while it was in flight. Um, by the time we hit four kilometers, all of the radios has, had stopped being able to talk to the ground. Um, and we only got signal back when we hit four kilometers on the way back down. And that's the reason we were able to find it. Um, so I don't know how the antenna placement could have been better. Like I, um, or like I have ideas in my head, but we won't know that until I range test again. So I didn't range test with this. Um, and that's a thing I do not recommend. Uh, you should range test your avionics. Um, so what we'll do before the next high powered flight or the next you know, super high stakes thing is we'll probably put something that is more omnidirectional in terms of antennas on the ground. We used a big, gaggy, very powerful directional antenna. And that's great when you know where the vehicle is and you can point to it. And as soon as you lose track of it, it becomes terrible because you're just slewing all over the sky. Um, and you know the chance that you actually hit the vehicle if you don't know where it is, is pretty low. Um, so I would range test before the next flight. Um, we think that there was probably some weird interaction between the aero pack forward retainer and the reaction wheel. Um, a lot of the antennas were sandwiched in between those two. And we think that there was maybe like, I don't even know, like maybe weird RF standing waves or something like that, that were messing with the radios. Um, but we didn't see problems on the ground. Um, so I just, you know, didn't think to, uh, <laughs> didn't think that if there weren't problems on the ground, there wouldn't be problems in flight. Um, Will you an updated channel trailer for 2022? Maybe, maybe towards the end of the year. Um, I have a couple of things that I really want to finish up before we do that. Um, 
Well, that would be that would be a fun idea. Do you have an idea of what diameter the motor for the space shot will be like? Yeah, we're thinking either a six to six inch vehicle, or if we want to really go all out and like vary it to space, we can do an eight to eight inch vehicle. The reason for doing a two stage um, is ease of uh, integration or ease of like moving things around. So um, two six inch vehicles are a lot easier to move with like a couple of friends than uh, one massive, like USC, the way they do their space shot. I think uh, CU, the way they're doing their space shot, um, th they, they have one single really beefy R motor. Um, and so you, you end up with this like eight inch or 12 inch diameter vehicle that um, is a little bit more difficult to carry around. Um, and so a lot of it is just sort of with, for, for ease of build, go with the two stage, even though you add a little bit more risk with igniting that upper stage. Um, okay, eh, here we go. We, uh, how were you planning to be able to transmit telemetry from such a high altitude or does it connect to sort of a network? Um, we had two, you know, we had an antenna on the ground and then an antenna on the vehicle and the link budget, like, the, the link budget said we would be able to communicate from that altitude. And it's surprising to me that we couldn't. Um, I don't have a better, I wish I had a better answer for you. Um, we were unable to communicate even with the link budget technically, theoretically saying we had enough power to broadcast to the ground or to transmit to the ground. So I don't, I don't quite have a great answer for you, and we won't have a good answer on that until we do more range testing. Um, do you have a Patreon? Yes, I do. Um, I should be posting there more often than I do, um, but right now is kind of a hectic time. But I do have a Patreon. If you want to support the project, um, that's a great way to do it. Um, it's just bps.space on Patreon. Um, and then Guy, I recognize this name. Guy says, looks like you are busy with other projects. Any plans to fin finish the miniaturized self-contained TVC system? Um, the next thing on the horizon, if I, for, for selling stuff, Signal R2 is still a good product, but um, I really want to do ARC. Um, see if I have one over here. One second here. Um, if I can ever push it past the finish line, I've made a dual deploy computer um, that I would love to get to the market. And it, the, the whole goal of this one is that it's supposed to be very easy to use. I feel like a lot of the problems with dual deploy computers um, is that it's just hard to interpret the beeps that they put out or anything like that. And so the goal is that this has like Bluetooth connectivity, it's the same app um, and it's a lot easier and more intuitive to use this. Um, but that requires work to get it past the finish line. And uh, my, my time is uh, somewhat constrained right now. So that's, that's what's next at least. Um, but it may be a little bit of a while before that happens. Um, all right. Um, well, thank you everyone for joining. I appreciate you uh, spending time listening to me talk about this rocket. If you wanna learn more, there are a bunch of videos about it on the BPS Space YouTube channel. Um, and I'd be happy to hear from you. Uh, my email is joe at bps.space. And, um, I mean, that's, that's about it. Yeah. Uh, I think I can just end the broadcast, right? Yeah, I think we're good. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and end the broadcast. Uh, thanks folks. Have a great one. Enjoy the rest of Narcon and I'll see you around.